All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my marine biology course. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Ravel, and you can either call me Dr. Ravel, you can call me Professor Ravel if you like, but I'm generally pretty laid back and I prefer to just go by my first name. So please feel free to just call me Tim. Uh, that's what I prefer. And about half my students or more uh, get used to that. And um, so there we go. Um, I've been teaching uh, biology at Mount San Antonio College now for about 25 years. And this being lecture one as it is, uh, let me briefly explain kind of what I expect you uh, to do and learn the content uh, as we present it and, and what that's all about. So first, uh, in the description or comment section of this video below, you'll find a link to this PowerPoint file. Um, and you can, this will take you to my website and you can find a syllabus there and other things, including this PowerPoint. And you might want to print off this PowerPoint and follow along and take notes as we go. You could also follow along and take notes using a tablet or a laptop if you prefer, but personally, and maybe because you know I'm a little bit older and kind of used to the old fashioned way of learning, I personally, I like the traditional note taking style of using printed notes and, and writing on them, uh, but I'll leave that up to you. Uh, I'm not gonna collect these notes uh, of any sort, and uh, you can sit and just listen if you want. But personally, I find that you learn much better. I do, I know, uh, if I use some kind of combination of listening and writing as I go. If you're confused on how to study, um, I'm going to also provide you in a link in the comment section below uh, with a um, how to study video. Uh, this is a, a strategy that uh, I try and teach all of my students. And it's a strategy I've slowly developed over like a 35 year period of being an undergraduate student and then a graduate student doing teaching assistants um, types of things. And then finally a professor. And so check that out if you find yourself struggling in my class or any other class for that matter on a best sort of practice on how to study uh, that I think works really well for me and many of my students. Okay, so for each lecture, uh, you're gonna have to learn the content of the lecture by the time you take the quiz or exam. And uh, the words uh, and, and the people, dates, and locations you'll see, I'll put those in red letters when I think those are some of the most important parts to remember to make sure that you study those. Uh, so the quizzes and exams are going to be closed note. So you'll have to get all this information somehow in your head and be able to recall it quickly. Um, and again, in my how to study video, I kind of explain one method by which to do that. So I'll leave that up to you. Um, I also suggest that you subscribe to this YouTube channel and then turn on the notification bells in YouTube and subscribing you probably already know is totally free and you can unsubscribe at the end of the semester. Um, but this is a useful way uh, for YouTube to be able to inform you when I upload the next lecture. And this, and this is particularly important in the winter intercession because the way my workflow works is I'll work on something and I'll upload it in the evening when everyone goes to bed in my house so I can maximize the bandwidth use um, and so it'll be up there that evening and ready to watch on YouTube if you want and then the next day after I get everyone out the door and take everyone to school uh, I'll be updating those links in canvas but my point is uh, you'll get that information uh, on that video posting 8 to you know 12 hours quicker uh, by having notifications turned on. And again, you don't have to do that. It's just um, one thing I suggest in terms of getting things done uh, quickly. So let's dive into the content um, of this course for the first lecture, uh, no pun intended, and uh, what we're going to learn about. So first of all, marine biology is a science. And so let's start with that part about what a science is. A, a science is a collection of, of information that is derived by applying the scientific method. Uh, the scientific method can be somewhat easily explained uh, using a nice example. And first, what we'll do as a scientist is uh, we'll observe something. So 
If you watch this video of this fish here, uh, when me and my, uh, my kids were out scuba diving in Hawaii last summer, we came across, you know, different animals and, and one of them was this fish here and we were watching it. And so this is a good example here. And the first thing we do is we come up with a question and we notice this observation about this fish. And our question is, what do you think it's doing? What do you think this fish is doing? So the curiosity of observing a behavior like this fish or anything else is a great starting point for basically all scientists. And the next thing then we want to do is we want to find out maybe why that is. Why is it walking that way or moving that? Way? So the next step then is we're going to generate a hypothesis and almost every kid knows that um, a hypothesis has a very specific definition. And hopefully you're thinking of that now. So I'm going to give you a second to see if you can answer that without needing my help. In fact, go down and scroll down to the comment section below and just type in your answer. So go ahead, pause this video right here and go down to the comment section and type in what you think a hypothesis is without looking anything up. Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Well, let's go from there. Okay. Now, hopefully you did that. It's always good to practice the, uh, not only the input of information, but also practice trying to use that information. So hopefully you came up with that a hypothesis is an educated guess, which is correct. But what does that mean? Well, a hypothesis is an educated guess, which means we try to explain something based on uh, information we already know about that particular thing. So if you take some guesses, you might say, that the fish is in this case looking for food or it's trying to attract mates or it's trying to intimidate us, whatever it might be, you can come up with a bunch of them. The next thing we try to do is develop an experiment to test our hypothesis or hypotheses, plural, because you could have a bunch of different hypotheses. So this part, this part, so this part can be challenging in terms of actually uh, doing it, um, the science part. So this part can actually be quite challenging in terms of the science part because experiments can be tricky to design. So let's say we decide the fish is looking for food, um, but does the fish always do this behavior? Does the fish do this only when looking for certain types of food? Um, is it doing this because we're around? Uh, do we need cameras out to observe this behavior when we're not there? So there are a lot of different things um, that might go into trying to figure out that question. Okay. So hopefully we pull off our experiment, get some results, and then we can decide if our hypothesis uh, or hypotheses are right or wrong. But this is really a cycle of, of events because after this, we might make new observations or it leads us to new questions. So the scientific process and this systematically critical way of thinking is a very powerful tool. And this is why the state, and uh, the county and the country and the whole universe for whatever powers may be have decided that basically all graduating college students should have some science course to understand this process and how it operates and what it means. Now, of course, we move on to the fact that you're taking marine biology. So you probably already figured out that the marine part refers to the sea and the ocean and the aquatic environment. And then the word biology refers to the fact that we're talking about life and being a living individual yourself, you are probably at least somewhat aware or familiar with the different aspects of being alive versus non-living things like rocks and sand. But briefly, all living things are capable of responding to the environment uh, by moving or getting out of the way or growing. Uh, all living things can a, contain a genetic code like DNA. That is a genetic material that explains how that particular organism is going to become what it is. And we'll talk more about that a little bit uh, throughout the class. Um, all living things are uh, able to maintain homeostasis, which is like this internal balancing act. So if your body temperatures 98.6 is a human. It has to stay somewhere around there. If it goes too high or too low, humans end up not doing very well. But uh, you could also do that with salt or water. And so living things all have these certain boundaries by which they have to stay in. 
and all living things are capable of evolving and we'll touch upon that as we go through the course as well and what uh, that means. Uh, all living things must also consume energy and all living things are able to reproduce for the most part. Um, and we'll discuss those as we go. So I've already mentioned uh, that science in general is important. So let's talk about specifically why we should care about marine biology. You know, why don't we have a class on desert biology or tundra biology or any other of the many different habitats, which, um, by the way, they actually do. Uh, but these are usually upper division or grad level classes and only a few schools have them here and there, uh, but they do exist. So when you're trying to get a large number of people to pay attention or care about something, it's uh, important or it often works, unfortunately, to demonstrate the tie to that thing uh, to money. Money's often a big motivator in how things work. So the phrase money isn't everything, while true, is common because money seems to be involved with um, like every decision making thing that happens. Uh, so you don't hear the phrase like happiness isn't everything or time isn't everything. Well, there you go. Okay. So it's difficult to measure the entire value of what the ocean monetarily provides for us. But one estimate where you kind of put all the factors in together and then we'll go through those is around 20 trillion dollars per year. And that's a lot of money. If you don't know, just in kind of hindsight and retrospect to it, um, that's a whole lot of money. If you didn't know $20 trillion, um, that is basically like the entire U.S. economy, all sectors, including whatever it does in the ocean um, per year. Okay. So for one, uh, a lot of people like to visit places like uh, Hawaii for vacation. They're looking for some warm tropical beachfront kind of vacation. There's about 10 million visitors to Hawaii per year, and that's a $17 billion industry. People go there for scuba diving and snorkeling and fishing and uh, kayaking and all kinds of things that you can do related to um, um, you know, recreation basically involving the ocean. A lot of people just like to go sit and lay on the beach and relax. And, um, and that's Hawaii. So then you also have places like Australia and Fiji and Costa Rica. And there are many other similar types of, you know, beach access locations, even in California, lots of, you know, millions of visitors come to California, uh, to just hang out at the beach in the summer. Seafood industries collectively bring in around 150 to 200 billion dollars. The most economically uh, valuable items there tend to be things like shrimp and tuna and salmon uh, tend to be some of the economically more valuable seafood uh, items. Whale watching is a $2 billion industry. Um, a single whale, just one whale in its life can generate about a million dollars in uh, profit in people just driving boats out to go whale watching and see the same whale. And I'm not talking about SeaWorld whales. And if you have watched the documentary Blackfish, you know all about maybe the um, troubles with that. So I'm talking about whale watching in nature with whales that don't have to do anything except just be there. Uh, deep sea mining is kind of a newer and growing trend um, with the discovery of diamonds and gold and silver and copper and other precious metals being discovered. Uh, so that's a, that's a, a resource that um, a lot of companies now are seeing uh, value in mining, uh, that type of thing. So a lot of profit there. Kelp uh, from the ocean is used in a, wide range of industries uh, and the pharmaceutical industries, uh, uh, toothpaste, it's used in shampoos and all that kind of stuff. And the, and the ocean absorbs about 25% of all the carbon dioxide uh, and is believed that marine organisms probably produce 50 to 80% of the oxygen we breathe. And uh, water has what we call very high specific heat. And so a large ocean such as the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean tend to have relatively stable temperatures on land as well as on uh, near the ocean. And so that tends to be favorable. So that's it uh, for a brief introduction to my marine biology course. 
Next up, we'll talk about a brief history of the field of marine biology, and I hope everyone's having an awesome day, and I will talk with you soon.